see, God wants to shelter us under his feathers and under his wings, you will find refuge. You will find a safe place. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Tuesday Night Bible Study with Godspeed Ministry. We welcome each and every one of you Godspeeders out there, and we are so grateful, so very grateful that you choose to spend this time with us. That just tells us that you are into the deep things of God. You want to know what he has in store for you, and you want to be able to honor him, glorify him, and give him everything that our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, which we just celebrated the, his death, burial, and resurrection this past weekend here in the U.S., and we just want to celebrate with you. We know that you are after the deep things of God, and I am so thrilled that you have chosen to be here with us tonight. Tonight, as you know, we have been on the study of preparing to meet our king. And as scripture says, Jesus Christ is coming back for a bride. The church is his bride. He is coming back for a bride without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. We've got some work to do. And that's why you're here. Because when he comes back, we want to be robed in righteousness, his righteousness, not ours. And we want to be ready for him. Tonight, we're going solo, looks like, as uh, Mike Imhoff and Jerry Blazier both have worked very hard, not feeling well tonight. So we miss Mike and Jerry both with us, but we're glad that you're here with us. And we want you to get the most that you can out of this Bible study tonight. You are not a spectator. You are a participator. So we want to know your comments your thoughts, your reactions, share your scripture with us, all of these different things. But we want to know that we want you to know that we are very glad that you have chosen to spend this time with us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, we bow before you so very thankful for everything you have done for us. Father, you did not spare your own son, Jesus but you freely gave him up in order to redeem us out of the hand of our adversary, out of the hand of the evil one. And Father, tonight we pray that this word be a word in season for so many people who are struggling in different areas. Maybe they are waiting for you to do something and they don't realize our part in this. Or maybe, Father, they've never been taught this. I thank you, Father, for your word. And tonight we come before you. We ask that the Holy Spirit speak through me to teach, to enlighten, to bring revelation in the hearts of every person who is watching. Father, we know that many nations are watching, and we thank you for that, Father. We thank you that you are giving us the opportunity as Godspeed Ministry to make disciples of all nations. Father, thank you for the technology. We just praise you and bless your holy name tonight, Father. Now let your word, which always stands faithful and true, Bring forth life. Be spirit and life tonight, Father, in the name and the power of Jesus, our Lord. And all God's people said, amen, amen. I know we are missing uh, some of you as many racers are, are getting ready to uh, come on here. So Joe Sanuti, man, it's good to have you on there. I wish you were on here with me, man. Uh, so it's great to have Joe with us tonight from down in Baxley, Georgia. So tonight we're going to get started and I want to go to the reason for the blood. The last few weeks we started out talking about the weapons of our warfare. We, as we've moved over into phase two of this Bible study of preparing to meet our king. Three weeks ago we talked about the word 
that his word is settled in heaven. His word will never fail. His word never changes. And everything, everything that we see or anything is upheld by the word. And we know that Jesus Christ is that word. We also know the word is the sword of the spirit. And we are going to see that we need to use that in a way it needs to come out of our mouth and that's where we are tonight as we get into our testimony but then the second week we looked at the blood of jesus and then or the name of jesus and then last week it was the blood of jesus as we came into holy week but i want you to grab your bibles and let's go back to exodus chapter 12. do you know I know many people don't ever go back to the Old Testament. Jesus said, I didn't come to do away with the Torah, the first five books of Moses. I came to fulfill it. And do you know that there are 7,000 hyperlinks, scripture references? If you were to take a chain linked, uh, not a chain link, a chain referenced. (laughs) If you were to take a chain reference Bible, you would see all of those references and all of those connections. So here we're going to go back to Exodus chapter 12. And we are going to take a look at part of our testimony and, and link it to where we're going in Revelation chapter 12. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter of Exodus 12, but I want you to understand that the people of Israel are in bondage. Pharaoh of Egypt has taken them captive. They came there peaceably, but Pharaoh has taken them captive and he has made slaves of them and he has had them doing hard labor. And Jesus, or God, excuse me, God sent Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell him, let my people go that they may worship me. It wasn't just to let my people go. God wanted us to come and worship him once we were free. That's the whole purpose. But anyway, Pharaoh's heart was hard. He was an evil man. And he did not want to lose free labor. He did not want to lose a major workforce that was building so much of his empire. So he resisted God. And God had to send plagues. He turned the rivers to blood. Can you imagine not having water? Can you imagine the smell and everything dying in that? He sent a plague of frogs. He sent gnats. He sent darkness. There were just so many different things that came. And each time Pharaoh would relent, then change his mind. Or he would just say no altogether. But now God is telling Moses that I'm going to release the death angel and I will take the life of every firstborn male that opens the womb, whether it is man or creature. And all of the other plagues had gone over Goshen, where the children of Israel were living. But this time, the death angel only knows one sign to pass over. And let's go to Exodus 12 and beginning in verse 1. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month will mark the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th of the month, Each man, the 10th of the month, each man is to take a lamb for his family. One lamb for the household. But if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor are to take one according to the number of the people. According to each person eating, you are to make your count for the lamb. Your lamb is to be without blemish a year old male. 
You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You must watch over it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to slaughter it at twilight. They are to take the blood and to put it on the two doorposts and on the crossbeam of the houses where they will eat it. They are to eat the meat that night roasted over a fire. With matzah and bitter herbs, they are to eat it. Matzah is also unleavened bread. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled with water, but only roasted with fire, its head and its legs and its inwards. So let nothing of it remain until morning. Whatever remains until the morning, you are to burn. And he says in verse 13, for I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. And I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. When you see the blood, I, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. So there will be no plague among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now, one of the things we need to understand here is the blood of the lamb held the lamb's life. We talked about this last week, that if we have no blood in us, there is no life in us. And we need the blood of the lamb for the cleansing of our sins. But here they had to capture the blood in a basin. They couldn't let any of the blood fall to the floor. It was too precious. It cost that lamb its life. And the God is saying the same about his son. Even John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Even the Roman centurion, when he watched Jesus die on that day of crucifixion, said, surely this was the son of God. So here we see the precursor. This was the rehearsal. And Jesus was the fulfillment. The blood in the basin, captured in the bowl, was precious. But it was not effective until it was applied. The lamb had been killed. The blood had been captured in a vessel. But the only way the death angel would pass over the household was for the blood to be applied to the doorpost and the crossbeam. We talked about this last week. You can go back and watch that. So here we are seeing that God is telling we must apply the blood to our lives. I think many of us understand and know that when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we accepted, believed in, and applied the blood of Jesus to our lives. But this is a continual process. We get dirty a little bit every day, but do you know how you and I apply the blood to our lives today? Derek Prince says it is found in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. Now we know the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Bible, speaks of Jesus in a way we've not seen him on this earth. He is coming back as the king that Israel has been waiting for. He is going to defeat Satan once and for all. So let's go to Revelation chapter 12, and let's look at verses 10, 11, and 12. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now have come the salvation and the power 
and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He who accuses them day and night before our God. They, talking about the saints, the ones who believe, they have conquered him, talking about Satan, the adversary, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so as to shy away from death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. He's not talking about the people on earth dwelling. He's talking about the people in heaven rejoicing. But woe to the earth and the sea. With great fury, the devil has come down to you knowing he has only a short time. But there was two things needed to overcome the enemy, the adversary of our soul. The blood of the lamb and the testimony of us. Derek Prince says that in this story I read to you out of Egypt, out of Exodus, they were to take a common plant. They are known as hyssop. And hyssop is still around today. There are so many scriptures, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. I use hyssop oil many times, especially if I'm needing to purify something. But they would take the hyssop plant, they would dip it in that vessel of blood, and then dripping with the blood, they would take and swat to sling, to cover, to anoint the doorpost and the crossbeam of their homes. Now, not everybody was in their own homes. Remember, it said, if your family's too small, then you eat with a neighbor. But whatever home where you're eating the lamb, the blood needs to be on the doorpost. The lamb was killed, the blood was caught, and then it was applied. You and I apply the blood of the lamb through our witness, our testimony, our testimony. How often do you testify about Jesus and what he's done for you in your life? What is it in our lives that Jesus has done that we tell others? You know, King David in the Old Testament, sometimes he said, I just have to stir up my own self. And encourage myself in the Lord. That's what God wants. When we talk about him, when we share what he has done for us, we encourage ourselves, but we encourage others. I hear so many people who talk about loving to hear a good testimony, a good story. It encourages us when we hear the story of what God has done for someone else. Amen? Isn't that awesome? We love that. We love to hear that. In fact, uh, Psalm 107 verse 2 says, The redeemed of the Lord Jehovah will say, that he saved them out of the hand of their oppressor. Derek Prince again says that if we don't say so, if we don't speak up, Satan takes our silence as agreement with him. Think about that for a moment. If we don't speak up and tell the devil what Jesus Christ has done for us, then he takes our silence as agreement that he can pilfer our homes, our lives. That he can come against us with sickness and disease. He can come against mm -hmm. us and have his way with us. And I don't think any of us want that. We don't mean to negate 
or downplay what Jesus Christ has done for us. But I think sometimes we just are concerned that our testimony, our witness, is not as great as someone else's. Who wants to hear what I've got to say? You want to know my testimony? I grew up in church from the time I was two weeks old. I went to church every Sunday. By the time I got to where they started giving the pins for attendance, I had my first year pen. And then by the time I was 18, I had a string of pins for every year. So I had 18 of those little bars saying that I had perfect attendance at church. Sometimes I went to church five days a week. We went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. We were there on Monday for witnessing or Bible study. And then my dad also was a praying man and he would go back and he would take us with him. And then we also cut the grass of the church. Every time the doors of the church were open, I was there. I was little Miss Goody Two Shoes, as people used to call me. But I had a bad case of religion. And I knew scripture. I thank God for the roots of that church that they put the scripture in me. But I didn't have the spirit of it. And I was hard and legalistic. Not a good Christian. I was part of, of the church and we had a revival when I was eight years old. And I remember this pastor who came to do the revival. He had shockingly red hair and he had it, it just stood up almost like a carrot top. And in that day, a children's time or a children's church was not part of our practice. I didn't even know of any other churches that did it. But this visiting pastor who had come to do a revival at our church had a children's time. And he invited all of the kids to come down and I was there and he had a little mini guillotine. And he said he needed a volunteer and somehow or another I, I ended up being the one that was chosen. And I remember he put my finger in there and I could feel that blade. He was going to cut off my finger. And I remember when that blade hit my finger, it felt like it went through. But yet my finger was still there. I thought it was a miracle at eight years old. So that night I walked down the aisle to give my life to Christ. And I remember standing up in the car. This was back before seatbelts. And I was standing up over in the back seat of the car and I was telling mom and dad, it went through my finger. I felt it go through. And they just smiled and laughed at me, but they were pleased that I had made a decision for Christ. And being vocal, I began to talk and testify about what Jesus had done in saving me. And then when I was 13, I saw, I, I felt the Holy Spirit. It was one Sunday night. I was at church and I was there with so many of my friends. And because I had made a profession of faith, other people had made professions of faith too that night when I was eight. And now here I am at age 13 and I'm standing in the pew on a Sunday night and the Holy Spirit is convicting me that I had fallen for a magic trick. I had not given my life to Christ. And I am gripping the back of that pew as tightly as I possibly can. Because for me to slip out and go back down that aisle and tell them that I wanted to give my life to Christ, admitted that I had told a lie when I was eight, all of my testimony was wrong and who would believe me the devil was giving me such a battle in my mind but the holy spirit 
was tugging at my heart. And I finally yielded and walked down that aisle a second time. And this time at age 13, I truly was ready to give my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. Don't you just love it that God gives us second chances? You see, my story is nothing great. In fact, it's almost shameful of how it came. But since that time, since that time, I have come to know him and to love him and to fellowship with him and have relationship with him. And he has healed me. He has delivered me. He has saved me. He has equipped me. He has put me in places I didn't have any purpose, any right to be. That's what it was. He had purpose. But in the world, I really didn't have a right to be where I was. And that was all because I was seeking him. I tell people all the time, the only reason that I'm the leader of Godspeed ministry is because he knows how much I need him. And I wish I could say I felt that always, but I've been self-sufficient and prideful in my walk with him since the age of 13. I've wandered away from time to time, but he's always been there. He's faithful. In fact, I was just teaching on that last night that to be faithful means to testify of what you know to be personally true. To be faithful means that you're going to be a witness in a court of law. And that once you agree to testify, you're only going to testify to what you know personally to be true and right. And you're going to stick to that testimony even if the opposition comes against you with threats of death. Boy, doesn't the enemy come after us trying to downplay us, trying to get us to stop testifying, trying to tell us, you don't know what you're saying. You have no right to, to do that. People are going to laugh at you. They're going to think you're crazy. They're going to think you're some sort of holy roller. But God has taught me all the little simple ways just to acknowledge him and to be a witness without trying to lead someone to the Lord friend of mine was here just today and we were talking about this she said I don't even know if I've ever led anyone to the Lord but I do know I've encouraged people but I told her it's just like in the New Testament where God says Paul was writing and he said that someone planted and someone else watered and someone else harvested you never know what your part in this is we have a testimony. It's ours. But it's also based upon the word of God. As we talked about last week, Derek Prince says that we tell Satan what the word of God says, the blood of Jesus does in our lives. And maybe it's only one verse you know. Maybe there's only one thing. But I have known that the more I trust God and let him lead, let him encourage me, put a thought in my mind, just being willing. In fact, the Holy Spirit says, he told the church, he said, they're going to take you before the authorities. You will be arrested for my namesake. You will be taken before the, the leaders, the judges, and the critics. And he said, don't worry about what you're going to say. For my spirit will put the words in your mouth. But like Psalm 107 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If there were a thief coming in your home and you saw him, 
Would you just stand there and watch him? Or would you cry, stop? Would you call the police? That's what our testimony is. When Satan comes against us with sickness, with disease, with trouble, are we going to the word of God and telling him what the word of God says as a child of God? We go to God asking him to do something, but Psalm 107 2 says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We have to speak up. There is a verse in the New Testament, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I think it comes out of the message where it says, our profession is our confession. Or our confession is our profession. Are you confessing the word of God? Do you speak? Speak its word, it, especially Psalm 91. Oh my goodness, that is such an awesome, awesome scripture where we can pray Psalm 91 over our lives. And I know I have used it so, so many times here through this last year of a, a worldwide pandemic. But let's just go to Psalm 91 and let's just see what God says. And I want you to take... Take this as your 911 call to God, but not to God. You need to confess this, confess it over your life and to the devil. Psalm 91 He who dwells in the shelter of Elonai will abide in the shadow of the Lord. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. Think about that, a refuge, a place to go and be safe, a fortress. It's a barrier against everything that comes against you. My God in whom I trust. For he will rescue you. Let's make this personal. For he will rescue me from the hunter's trap. Think about that. God is going to rescue you and me from the hunter's trap. This is not a person or some trapper out in the woods. This is the enemy of our soul. From the hunter's trap and from the deadly pestilence. I've stood on this verse. I either trust God or I lean on my under, own understanding, which scripture says don't do that. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your steps. As much as possible this past year, I have tried to live my life as normally as possible. Not in fear because I placed my trust in God and his word because his word will not fail. It cannot fail. Whew, that's power. You see, when we start stirring ourselves up like David did, when we start encouraging ourselves and being there in the word of God and making up our mind, who am I going to trust? Who do I put my faith in? Is it the media? Is it the forever changing variables of numbers and this is safe to do and that's safe to do? And you talk about confusion. There's every sort of confusion out in the world and on the internet. But this, this has been here for thousands of years and it changes not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I've made a decision to put my trust and my faith in him. He says, he will rescue me from the deadly pestilence. He will cover me with his feathers. Get the picture uh, of, of a hen that gathers her flock. Jesus even used this term 
after he rode into Jerusalem on that donkey and he was hailed with Hosanna, Hosanna what, on what we term Palm Sunday. But now, after all of the Hosannas and the parade is over, he goes up on the mountain and he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you would not. See, God wants to shelter us under his feathers and under his wings, you will find refuge. You will find a safe place. His faithfulness is body armor and shield. His, his faithfulness is body armor and shield. I will not fear the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the plague that stalks in darkness, nor the scourge that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, but it will not come near me. That's my God. That's my God. This is, this is a letter to me from my father and to you as well. You will only look on with your eyes and you will see the wicked paid back. For you have made the Lord your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge. So no evil shall befall me, nor any plague come near my tent, my dwelling. For he will give his angels charge over you to guard you in all your ways. Upon their hands they will lift you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra, trample the young lion and the serpent. I'm going to stop right there. Think about David. Do you remember when David went to face Goliath? Remember the story of this huge giant and David took five small stones and Goliath roars at him and said, what am I a dog that you come at me with a child and sticks and stones? And David said, the Lord has delivered the lion and the bear to me. David dwelt with God. He trusted him. He learned to trust him. He killed a bear with his bare hands. Do you have that kind of trust in God? One way we get our faith and our trust in God built up is hearing ourselves say so. Hearing ourselves. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. How many times have your ears heard you decreeing these things, saying these things, reading the scripture over your life and your family? Has Satan heard you claiming the promises of God? Have your family heard you praying over them? Have you looked at what God has to say? And do you put more stock in this? Do you feed yourself more on the word of God than on what the media, the internet and others say? I've got some of our chaplains. I've got Gary Bingham and Keith Peterson and Joe Samudi all on here watching with you out there on Facebook Live. And these men, as Keith, Keith always says, he stands on that one scripture. He says, I'm, I'm not educated to do this. But he says, I stand on the one scripture that even though they were unlearned or uneducated, schooled men, that people could tell they had been with Jesus. 
How do you get to spend time with Jesus? In his word. Reading and claiming and saying what God has done for you. Because he has devoted his love to me, I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he knows my name, my reputation, who I am. Not just, hey, Renee, but he knows the essence of who God is. And when he calls on me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him. I will honor him. And with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let me share with you something of what I was watching with Rick Renner today on YouTube. And old Keith, he put this verse out there of Acts 4.13. That's his life verse. But let me get back to sharing with you about Rick Renner. He was in Ephesus in one of the ancient cities in the book of Revelation that Jesus wrote to in, in the, those seven churches. And in Ephesus was a slave market. It was huge, huge. And in this slave market, people brought other human beings to be sold and other people came to buy slaves. Rick Renner says that there was probably about 60,000 slaves in the city of Ephesus in the beginning of time after or in the time after Jesus's death when the new believers were coming on and many of these slaves became Christians and they could be killed for professing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But Rick was standing in this huge ancient, the ruins of where this slave market had been. And he said, can you imagine the humility, the, the degradation of the people who were put up on the block to be sold. He said, if someone was looking at you to buy you, they had the right to examine you. They could walk up to you and pry open your mouth and look at your teeth. If you had healthy teeth, they assumed that you were healthy and would be a good investment. And so therefore you would bring more money as Rick was saying in this program. And he said 60,000 people came through that market of being sold and resold. And, and these people were just property, just property. And the owner could do with them the same as he could do with a piece of cloth or a piece of paper that he no longer wanted. He could kill you. He could sell you. He could... He could make your life miserable. And that's what Satan, our accuser, our adversary does. Scripture says that he has taken us captive if, to do his will. And that's what a slave is. It's that you're captive. You can no longer make your own decisions. You can't live where you want to live. You can't eat what you want to eat. You can't go where you want to go. You are there to serve, to meet the needs of another person. And they tell you what, when, how, how long, and all of that. And that's what the enemy does. So Rick was in this place describing that this is what Satan was doing to the people of God. He's done it since Adam and Eve. He wants to snare us, to trap us, and enslave us to do his will. We may think drugs and alcohol or something else. But so many times it's just not getting along with our brothers and sisters in Christ. 
or other people. Satan wants to put a wedge between us. Let me read this to you at first John one first John seven. It's only one chapter in first John. But if we really walk in the light, that is, if we live each and every day in conformity with the precepts of God. As he himself is in the light, we have true unbroken fellowship with one another. He with us and we with him and the blood of his son cleanses us from all sin by erasing the stain of sin, keeping us cleansed from sin in all its forms and manifestations. Jesus wants us to walk in and forgiveness just as Jesus did just as he did here on this earth remember one of the last words one of the seven phrases Jesus said on the cross is father forgive them they don't know what they're doing tonight I want to encourage you to apply everything that Jesus Christ did for you as in this in his word i want you to claim those promises even if the devil is coming after you i want you to plead the blood and say lord forgive me cleanse me once again from my sin from my unrighteousness and father make me in right standing not my own righteousness apply to me the righteousness of jesus christ and restore to me the joy of my fellowship. And Father, I will speak your word over my life, over my family, over my business, over my children's school, my home, my property. I will speak it over the organizations. That's one of the things I am privileged to do is to pray God's word over the organizations that we minister to. And when I see Satan coming, I'm like, no, Lord, close that door. I plead the blood of Jesus over them. Keep them, protect them, Father. I know they have their own way, their own right to do so. But I know that I can still pray and plead the blood of Jesus over them and over you. That's why I'm so thankful that you're choosing to be here with us in this Bible study. You want to know how to walk in victory. You want to know how to live life to the fullness, overcoming the evil one, stopping the thief from stealing, killing, and destroying us. Remember, we talked about that a little bit last week, that word to destroy is to actually to slurp up that he wants to pulverize us to where he just slurps us up but not if you know the bible not if you're willing to confess find something ask god if you want to start with psalm 91 or maybe you want to go to revelation 12 11 then they overcame him by the word of the lamb let me go back there and just read all of this again, because you need to know this. They have conquered him. What happens when you conquer something? You're the victor, aren't you? When you conquer, you've defeated. And that's what Jesus did to Satan on the cross. But you and I have to in act it in our lives we have to walk in that victory we don't coast it's like being on a river if you're i was up at niagara falls and i saw where time after time people had been on the river upstream especially in the olden days and they had not known that there was a waterfall down downstream they got in a boat and quit rowing and they're just enjoying the day and all of a sudden they start hearing roaring and they're like what's that 
And then they realize, whoa, we're moving really fast in this boat. And then they start trying to row and the current is too fast and too swift and they're swept overboard. We can't be idle in our Christianity. Christianity is active. We have an adversary who wants to defeat us, to steal our faith, to then kill our trust in, in Jesus Christ so that he can then pulverize us, wear us out, wear us down, and slurp us up. Maybe you feel like that's what he's doing to you today. But if you're still alive, it's not too late. They overcame him. They conquered him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so as to shy away from death. Just like in Exodus, when the children of Israel were faced with the death angel coming through and their only protection wasn't the death of the lamb. It wasn't the collection of the blood in a vessel. The only sign that kept the death angel away from them was applying the blood with hyssop over the doorpost. It covered either side. Think about this, get the picture that when you're going through a doorpost, it's covering your mind, your head. God wants to transform us and it's never too late. If you're still here, God has a purpose and a plan. You're not done yet. And God is in the saving, the redeeming business. Remember those slaves? When people would come by and buy, Jesus' blood bought us. That word redeemed means purchased. You are not your own. You are bought with a price, with the very precious blood of Jesus Christ. And when Satan comes after us, we need to be able to tell him, look, you have no right. I belong to Jesus Christ. And if there's anger, unforgiveness because of a divorce, because of betrayal, because of whatever, whatever, you need to get rid of it. Because that gives Satan legal right. We can't have unforgiveness. Forgive us our debts, our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lord's Prayer. We are here for you. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price with his life, his blood. He presented it in the very throne of heaven to his father. And when he took that bowl that of his own blood and presented it in heaven. He said, Father, this is the payment for everyone, anyone who will call on my name. I will save them. I will cleanse them. I will, I will buy them back. And that's what he did. That's when we celebrate. Every other religion in the world asks you and me to earn our salvation. Jesus said it's impossible because it's only the blood that can give life. And it must be the blood of a spotless lamb. And there's only been one. As Steve Longmire said last week, there's only been one person in all of human history that was ever perfect on the tree and that's Jesus Christ. You and I have a part. We can't just rest 
we have to say so. Say what God says. Let the devil know, you know your rights and you're going to protect your home, your property. And by your words of encouragement and the smile on your face, you're going to stir other people up too. I hope you've been stirred up tonight. If so, I'd love to know, has this been an encouragement to you? Have you learned anything in this? I pray you are blessed by it. I pray you know the way to overcome, to defeat, to conquer the enemy of your soul. Don't be silent anymore. It's time to speak up. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we bow before you tonight. We are so thankful that you have been here with us. We thank you, Father, that you were willing to give your only son, Jesus Christ, and that he, Father, willingly went to that cross to suffer for us, to redeem us, to buy us from the slave market of Satan. so that we could be restored in right fellowship with you and be joint heirs with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, forgive us for all the ways we have failed to rise up. Forgive us for unforgiveness. Father, we pray and release Those who have caused us bitter divorces, those who have betrayed us, those who have drunk driving, who have taken the lives of young people. And Father, today, even so many different murders in so many different ways. Father, let us rise up, not in our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit and forgive Whatever it is, it isn't working for us to hold on to it. No, they don't deserve it, but neither did we, Father. Neither did we deserve for you to die for us. Father, I pray for the Holy Spirit to bear witness with each and every one listening to this. Today's the day. It's time to let it go. The only one you're hurting is you. You're separating yourself from God and you're opening a door to Satan. And the one that you're angry with, the one that you're holding this unforgiveness is going free. And Satan is laughing. Go ahead. You don't deserve to forgive him. He doesn't deserve it. But God says it's the only way to freedom. And with your mouth, you make the confession that, Father, I choose through the power of the Holy Spirit to apply the blood of Jesus. I release them. I forgive them. I place them in your hands as the righteous judge. And I trust you, Father, to vindicate me and to bring justice, righteousness and reconciliation. Wow, did you just feel that? Thank you, Father. And now we bless those who have despitefully used us. We pray for their health and their their relationship with you. We pray for you to be good to them and give them favor. Father, let your word be the power in our lives and all God's people said so so if you will just type in so in the comments let the redeemed of the Lord say so amen means so be it so I'd love to to know that you're going to apply this I'd love to know that this has blessed you and touched you And I look forward to seeing you again next week. So, Keith Peterson, I love it, love it, love it, love it. Joseph Nutty, 
Uh, so Godspeed even says so out there with uh, so <laughs> I like the capital letters so with an exclamation point. Amen and amen. Godspeed, friends. We thank you so much. We thank you for your support and your prayers. And if there's any way that we can pray for you, we can minister to you, please reach out to us on our central hub or reach out to us here on Facebook or YouTube. We're here to help you be all God intended you to be. Godspeed, friends. Thank you so much. Melissa Millian saying so. Gary Bingham saying so. All right. You guys are a blessing to us. We thank you. We'll see you next week.